The skull is an instantly recognisable part of the human body, but most will know little about its anatomical makeup. The skull is actually composed of 22 bones, which are themselves arranged into three key regions, the domed calvarium, the cranial base, and the viscerocranium. As the calvarium and cranial base enclose the brain, they are often discussed together as the neurocranium. Except for the mandible, every bone in the skull is joined together by completely immobile suture joints, which act only to hold the bones together in rigid alignment. Today, we're going to learn a bit about each of the bones of the skull and how they relate to the functions this complex structure must permit. My name's Connor, and welcome to Anatomy 101. Let's start by looking at the bones of the neurocranium. The domed roof of the neurocranium is known as the calvarium and is composed of four bones. The most anterior of these is the frontal bone, which produces the forehead as well as part of the nasal bridge and the superior part of the orbit, or eye socket. This prominence just above each orbit is known as the superciliary arch and is approximately where your eyebrows sit. You may also notice this small indentation just on the cusp of the orbit, which is known as the supraorbital notch. It makes way for the supraorbital nerve, artery and vein. The frontal bone has these bony ridges that protect laterally to connect to the zygomatic bones in your cheeks. They are thus known as the zygomatic processes. This part of the frontal bone is known as the glabella, and the part where it joins the nasal bones is the nasion. The last thing to note of the frontal bone is that on its interior sit the paired frontal sinuses, which produce mucus that drains into the nasal cavity. The next two bones of the calvarium are the paired parietal bones, which form the lateral and superior part of the neurocranium. These are best seen from the side and above. There's not a lot in the way of bony landmarks, but pay attention to this ridge of bone that runs in a crescent shape across the frontal and parietal bones. It's formed by the attachment of the temporalis muscle, which aids in chewing. Looking from above, we can see that the parietal bones join each other down the midline at the sagittal suture, join the frontal bone at the coronal suture, and join the occipital bone at the Y-shaped lambdoid suture. Where the anterior sutures meet is known as the bregma, whilst the posterior sutures meet at the lambda. Lastly, note these two small perforations in the parietal bones known as the parietal foramina. The final bone of the calvarium is the single occipital bone which forms the most posterior part of the skull. The occipital bone forms the foramen magnum and is the point of attachment for a few very important ligaments that stabilise the neck and spine. One of these is the nuchal ligament, which attaches to the occipital bone at the external occipital protuberance, which sits right here. This is also a point of attachment for the large trapezius muscle. Extending outwards from the external occipital protuberance are the superior nuchal lines, which are also the points of attachment for trapezius, as well as the splenius capitis and occipitalis muscles. Inferior and parallel to these are the paired inferior nuchal lines, which serve as points of attachment for several key neck muscles. Finally, there's a bony ridge running from the external occipital protuberance to the foramen magnum known as the external occipital crest. Together, these four bones enclose the brain and protect it from trauma and infection. If you look at them in cross-section, you can see that each bone has a sandwich-shaped structure, with a hard outer and inner cortical layer bordering a soft marrow interior known as the diploe. We'll discuss this in more detail in our scalp video, but remember that this structure is a clever compromise to absorb traumatic forces whilst maintaining some compressibility. OK, now let's cover the remaining bones of the neurocranium, those that compose the cranial base. We actually have a much more detailed video covering the anatomy of the cranial base, which I'll link to in the description. But for today, we'll cover the salient points to get you on your way. To view the cranial base, we need to cut the skull in a transverse plane like this and remove the domed calvarium. The view we're getting here is a top-down view of the cranial base with aforementioned parts removed. The nose is up here and the ears sit approximately here. The cranial base is organised into three tiers, or fossae, which descend anterior-posteriorly, a bit like a staircase. They are arranged like this in order to accommodate the lobes of the brain, 
Additionally, there are numerous perforations in the bones of the cranial base that allow structures such as nerves, arteries and veins to enter and exit the neurocranium. The most anterior tier of bones is the anterior cranial fossa. This is composed of parts of the frontal, ethmoid and sphenoid bones. Directly underneath this fossa are the orbit and nasal cavities. The frontal bone curves backwards to form most of the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. It has this bony ridge that runs upwards in the midline known as the frontal crest. This is the point of attachment for some of the connective tissues that hold the brain. Immediately posterior to the frontal crest is a really similar bony ridge, but this time coming from the ethmoid bone. This is known as the Christa Gali. The Christa Gali gets its name from Latin roots and literally translates to rooster's crest. Either side of the Christa Gali are the perforated cribriform plates of the ethmoid bone, which allow the olfactory nerves to enter the skull. The ethmoid bone also has a small number of air sinuses inside it. The sphenoid bone is really complicated and could probably take a whole video dedicated to it. It produces a big chunk of the anterior cranial fossa as well as the next tier down, the middle cranial fossa. The parts of the sphenoid bone and the anterior cranial fossa are their lesser wings, which go all the way out to the lateral skull, and the anterior clinal processes, which project posteriorly to attach to more connective tissue. This ridge of sphenoid bone is known as the prechiasmatic sulcus and is the midline border between the anterior and posterior cranial fossae. The parts of the sphenoid bone in the middle cranial fossa are the cella tersica, which is where the pituitary gland sits, and the posterior clinoid processes. The sphenoid bone has a number of openings in it, which you'll be familiar with if you've studied the cranial nerves. These are the optic canal, superior orbital fissure, foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, and foramen spinosum. Lastly, Note that like the frontal and ethmoid bones, the sphenoid has a nasal sinus sitting in its interior known as the sphenoid sinus. These are the parts of the sphenoid bone that you can see from the outside. Important to note is that there's a weak point in the skull where the sphenoid, frontal, parietal and temporal bones meet that's known as the pterion. The rest of the middle cranial fossa is produced by the paired temporal bones and part of the parietal bones. Like the sphenoid, the temporal bones have lots of important anatomy to remember, so we'll do a more detailed video on them later. For now, let's know that the temporal bone is composed of five parts, two of which we can see here on the interior, and the remaining three we can only see from the outside. Here we see parts of the dense petrous temporal bone and the thin squamous temporal bone. From the outside, we had the tympanic part of the temporal bone, which encloses the middle and inner ear, the styloid processes of the temporal bone, which protect inferiorly, and the zygomatic processes of the temporal bone, which extend anteriorly to join the zygomatic bone. You can feel the zygomatic processes as part of your cheekbone. The remaining parts of the temporal bone to be aware of are the mastoid process, which is a big chunk of bone behind your ear, and the mandibular fossa and articular tubercle, which are the parts of the temporal bone that articulate with your mandible at your jaw joint. Lastly, there are four perforations in the inner temporal bone known as the hiatus of the greater petrosal nerve, hiatus of the lesser petrosal nerve, the carotid canal, and the internal acoustic meatus. There's also an opening at the border of the temporal, sphenoid, and occipital bones known as the foramen lacerum. The last part of the neurocranium is the posterior cranial fossa, which houses the cerebellum. It's composed of parts of the temporal bones, a tiny part of the parietal bones, and a big part of the occipital bone. This huge hole in the occipital bone is known as the foramen magnum and is where the spinal cord originates. The flat ridge anterior to this is known as the clivus and the bony ridge to the posterior is known as the internal occipital crest. The foramen to be aware of here are the jugular foramen between the occipital and temporal bones and the hypoglossal canal which sits entirely within the occipital bone. Wow, that's a lot of anatomy, but so far we've managed to cover the entirety of the bony calvarian and the cranial base. All we have left to cover is the front of the face, known as the viscerocranium. There are 14 bones in the viscerocranium, some of which we've covered already. On the lateral parts of the face are the zygomatic bones, better known as your cheekbones. We already know that these connect to the frontal bone via the frontal process, 
and the temporal bone by the temporal process. They also connect to the maxillae via this anterior maxillary process. The zygomatic bone forms the lateral part of the bony orbit. We know that the roof of the bony orbit is the frontal bone, and the most posterior orbit is produced by the sphenoid bone. On its medial aspect is the ethmoid bone, as well as the small and flat lacrimal bone, which encloses the nasolacrimal duct. The floor of the orbit is composed mostly of the maxilla, which is the large bone forming the majority of your medial face. The two maxillae have a zygomatic process, which joins the zygomatic bone, and an alveolar process, which produces the upper jaw and houses the upper row of teeth. The maxilla also forms the lateral part of the nasal cavity and part of the roof of the palate via its palatine process. The maxilla is the last bone in the skull to have a nasal sinus within it. Lastly, the maxilla has a perforation in its anterior known as the infraorbital foramen. This allows passage of the infraorbital artery, vein and nerve. The last bone of the orbit is the palatine bone, which forms a tiny part of its floor. These two L-shaped bones also form the back of the nasal cavity as well as part of the posterior hard palate. The last parts of the upper viscera cranium are the two flat nasal bones, which simply form the front of the nasal cavity, the vomer, which forms the posterior part of the nasal septum, and the inferior nasal conche, which are curved bones that sit inside the nasal cavity. The final bone of the skull is the large curved lower jawbone, more properly known as the mandible. This is the only truly mobile bone in the entire skull and its movements are involved in several functions including chewing, sucking, speaking and breathing. The mandible can be divided into a large anterior section and two vertically projecting rami in its posterior. The anterior section can be subdivided into an alveolar process, in which the 16 lower teeth sit, and the body, which contains two perforations known as the mental foramina. The body is marked by a few ridges known as the mental symphysis in the midline, the mental tubercles in the inferior border, and the triangular mental protuberance in the lower middle. The rami are a little more complicated, and split at their top into two more sections. These are the coronoid process, which projects a little anteriorly to attach to the temporalis muscle, and the neck, which attaches to the lateral pterygoid muscle before continuing upwards to produce the head. The head is the part of the mandible that articulates with the temporal bone at the temporal mandibular or jaw joint. The last things to note are that this corner of the mandible is known as the angle, and these two bony protuberances are known as the oblique lines. And there we go. That's a comprehensive covering of all of the bones of the skull. We'll eventually be releasing more detailed videos on various parts of the head, such as the individual bones, the scalp, temporal mandibular joint, and the mysterious underside of the skull. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you don't want to miss out. For now, I hope you learned something, and have a great day.